Okay, so now let's move on to the second part of the video, which deals with what can you call them on. These are common creationist tactics that you can completely blow them out of the water when you see them doing it. And this is essentially all that you need to know when you're debating them. So the first thing are just the utter factual inaccuracies that they're talking about. Now, keep in mind, the typical creationist isn't educated in science whatsoever. They have no more than a high school level education in biology. And it's all very confusing. Science is hard. And so you kind of have to stop and think about it from their perspective, too. Um, they're just very confused individuals. Now, there are two particular factual inaccuracies. That is, uh, the second law of thermodynamics being violated and evolution just being a theory. And this should be, instead of just getting frustrated at this, stop and think. Because this is a clear red flag that the person doesn't know what they're talking about. And if they use the second law of thermodynamics as an example, blow them out of the water. Because, again, this should be an enormous red flag of a person arguing about something that they know nothing about. Um, this should be a clear indication of things. Um, check out my other video, Top Myths About Evolution, where I'll go into basically all the um, factual inaccuracies, such as there being no transitional forms, Darwin recanting on his deathbed, and crap like that. Um, check out that video, because I simply don't have time to explain it all here. But... Use them, listen to their arguments, and gain their insight. After you've heard them a couple times, you can get a sense of what type of person you're dealing with. Okay, one of the next things to watch out for is them doing something called moving the target, which is a logical fallacy. After you've presented your argument for evolution and things like that, they will stop and oftentimes say, well, that still doesn't explain how living matter can come from non-living matter, or things like that. That is a biogenesis, not evolution. Evolution only deals with life once it's already on Earth. So a biogenesis is completely irrelevant to that fact. Um, evolution doesn't explain how life got here, just like gravity doesn't explain how life got here. So watch out for that. So moving on, the second thing to look out for, especially, is quote binding. This is where they take a quote from a scientist or Darwin or anything like that completely out of context and use it to support their position. Um, you'll often see this done with Dr. Alan Fiducia of talking about Archaeopteryx, talking about Darwin with the eye, Gould and transitional fossils, anything like that. Basically, just understand two things. First of all, it's an argument for, from authority in the sense of the, just because somebody important says something doesn't necessarily make it true. Um, if the facts contradict it, then they're mistaken, nonetheless. Another thing to look out for is, or another thing supporting that is, virtually every serious scientist accepts evolution, and I'm not exaggerating there. Literally, just about every single one. Um, PubMed, there are over 200,000 papers published supporting evolution and zero neglecting it. Even the... Michael Behe, who is the closest thing to resembling a creationist scientist, accepts common descent, that is, that we share a common ancestor with primates. So whenever you hear of any kind of creationist um, quote an actual scientist as, as saying evolution is improbable or anything like that, stop and find out what they're actually saying. Do a Google search on it, because I can virtually guarantee you it is all out of context. Call them on that as well, because to my recollection, that's bearing false witness. Now another fantastic tool that you can use, and this is very important, is take anything that they say, any example, and apply it to any other theory. For example, if they argue that evolution is just a theory, well, wait a minute, atoms and cells are just theories too. Does that make them false? Um, it can also be said about whenever they post passages from the Bible talking about the, the theories of man and minds of man, stop and say, well, wait a minute, uh, what about us being made of cells? What about us being made of atoms? What about the Earth Earth being round? Those are all man-made theories. Does that mean that they're false too? And that's actually a, a pretty powerful tool, if you know how to use it, is lining up um, evolution and something like the Earth being round and seeing the logical fallacies in the Earth being round comparison and then applying that to evolution as well. For example, the... Um, People, creationists saying that, that evolutionists think that they're idiots just because they believe something different, because they don't accept evolution. Well, no, it's not really because of that. It's, it's the reasoning, too. But what would happen if a person didn't accept that the Earth was round? I frankly view creationists the exact same way. They're ignorant of the evidence, willfully or just by lack of education. Um, also, take a look at the teach the controversy idea. Um, should we teach evolution? Well, yeah, that, that's fine. Should we teach alternatives to it? Well, let me substitute in gravity, or let me substitute in the atomic theory. Should we, should we teach the alternative theory that instead of being made of atoms, everything is made of Jesutrons? 
I mean, should we be also teaching that the Earth is flat just because it's a different theory? Like, no. So why should we do that for evolution? Why should we ignore all the facts and teach the controversy? So something like that and substituting um, in a well-known field of science in your, in your mind for evolution can really easily allow you to refute the vast majority of their arguments as well. Now, another logical fallacy that creationists love to use, and you should call them on every time when they do, is a converse accident fallacy. And that's essentially where you take an exception to the rule and apply it where it need not be applied. For example, Dr. Jonathan Serfati of the Creation Ministries International loves to use this when we're debating. Um, I remember last month we were talking about how freshwater fish and saltwater fish could survive the flood. And he went off and, and basically listed three or four types of fish that can survive in fresh and salt water, and consequently they all could, was his line of reasoning. Well, in his infinite wisdom, he neglected to overlook, or he neglected to account for the fact that that accounts for point zero 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 one percent of all fish species on the, year, on the earth. You know, well, that's fine, that's how they could have got there and survived it, but what about the remaining 99.999%? He was trying to t make an exception, or he was trying to take an exception to the rule and apply it throughout, which you simply can't do. It's a logical fallacy, and you should call them on that every time. And one of the last fallacies that creationists love to use is basically just an argument from ignorance, saying, well, I don't know how a structure like the eye could have evolved, therefore Jesus did it. Or, uh, I don't know how matter was created, scientists don't know that, so God did it. You know, basically saying that they don't know how something happened, therefore God did it. It's a logical fallacy, heck, um, 300 years ago, people didn't know um, what caused snowflakes exactly. Does that mean that God makes snowflakes, and suddenly when we find out, he doesn't? No, it, it doesn't mean that at all. It's a logical fallacy, and just because you don't know something doesn't mean that God did it, and you should call them on that. And the last thing that I'm going to touch on is the argument for design. That is, you'll often hear people like Ray Comfort and Kirk Cameron using this, and they'll say, when you look at a Coca-Cola can, you know that it had a designer. You know, when you look at a, a car, you know that it was engineered. When you look at a painting, you know that it had a painter. Well, yeah, because that's the only natural explanation for how you could have a, a painting or a car or anything like that come into the world. I mean, there's, there's no natural process that could create a car or a Coca-Cola can. Now, you need to stop and take that and put it into perspective and ask yourself, is there a natural process that could form other complex structures? For example, let's take a look at snowflakes. If you didn't know better, those are some of the most complex structures on Earth. I mean, just take a look at this. Does this not look designed? Now, does that mean that there is a god hand-painting every single individual um, aspect of that? Every single snowflake that there is? Or... If there is a god, could he simply have designed a system to create that snowflake via natural means? Yes, it's called freezing and crystallization. Um, same thing can apply to evolution. If there is a god, does he necessarily have to hand paint every single type of organism on the earth? Or could he simply have the knowledge and foresight and intelligence to look ahead and set up a system knowing what the outcome would be, um, a natural system that is, to create these things? Now again, take a look at the snowflake, then take a look at this. Which one looks like it had a designer? And if you frankly believe that you're that there's a snowflake making god out there making all these snowflakes, then I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> well, I hope that this was helpful to everybody. I basically just thought that I would give you all my two cents and something that I had learned in my experience with debating creationists. Um, let me know if you have a particular problem that you come across that I didn't address here, or if you have any tips, and maybe there'll be a third installment in this. Thanks, guys. And as always, if you like what you hear, subscribe. Send me a message. By all means, have a good one, guys.